Welcome to Worship Westminster. I'm Pastor Chris Ward. We are so glad that you are with us today as we continue to study God's Word together. We started last week looking at this book that is like no other book, uh, re reminding us that God is actually speaking to us through these pages. Uh, and I pray that as we uh, gather again today to look at God's Word, that uh, you might hear God speaking to you and, uh, and firming up your faith a little as we, uh, as we walk this journey together. As we begin our time of worship, I would ask that you pray with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being a God who speaks to us, uh, for being a God who sees us and loves us and knows us as we are and is transforming us even now by the power of your word. Lord, we pray that uh, we would be open to hearing your voice today. Uh, so come by your Holy Spirit and open our lives. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's worship God. So if you would turn with me in your scriptures to the prophet Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Now these might be familiar words often heard around Christmas time, and if you like classical music, you might recognize them as the opening words to Handel's Messiah. In fact, I could sing that tenor aria, comfort me, except that I'm actually really out of shape and wouldn't navigate those runs all that well. So instead, I'm going to read it. As always, as we come to God's word, listen for the living Lord speaking to you. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, of our God, will stand forever. Well, indeed, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, there's actually kind of a, an irony in that verse that we quote so often. It tells us that everything fades, that grass fades, that people fade even. But the word of the Lord will never fade. And yet, what is this word of God given through the person Isaiah? What is it written on? Well, we're going to come back to that in a minute. Now, I want to point out that this passage on the unfading word of God is sandwiched in between Two very clear messianic promises. Made, make straight the way of the Lord because his grace is coming. He is coming. He's going to straighten everything out. It's a promise that what was long understood as foretelling the coming of the Messiah, God's chosen Savior. And then there's this little bit about the unfading word. And then we're coming back after this passage. Actually, we come back to the Lord. Well, again, he's coming. He will tend his flock like a shepherd, Isaiah says. He will gather the lambs in his arms. The Lord is coming, and he will take care of us. Except that Isaiah's just said that we're all like grass. People fade, like grass fades. How can God take care of us if we're all destined to fade? And that's that tension that we see in Scripture. God's word doesn't fade. Except again, what, what is this word written on? Whatever it was written on, even if originally, it was something that has a tendency to fade because everything fades. You know, this is actually one of the biggest issues that we face when we start to talk about ancient documents like the Bible. Everything fades. All writing fades and decays. History fades and decays. Even things that are carved into stone fade and decay. 
And if history itself fades with time, then how can we be sure that this word that we have, this book that is like no other, how can we be sure it's, it's reliable? Uh, that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Is this reliable? So let me show you just an example of this problem of fading. An example of fading. Here I have a copy of uh, a copy of a copy of a copy, who knows how many times it's been copied, of the works of Flavius Josephus, a first century Jewish historian. Uh, this book was a, a gift from a former member. Anel, if you happen to be watching, we sure do miss your smile. You are loved, dear sister. Anyhow, this copy of a copy of a copy, who knows how many times, uh, was printed actually in 1899, which makes this book itself 124 years old. And while it's obviously still a book, it's also obviously starting to fall apart. Right? Time presses on and material things don't stand up. The binding is clearly dissolving, the pages are, are starting to fall out, and, uh, and, and inside, actually, if you look at the words, the words around the edges are starting to blur um, as the ink is diffused outwards. Maybe it's due to moisture, while the words in the center are simply fading with age. You know, paper doesn't last forever. Ink doesn't last forever. It all starts to break down and to decay. And this is after only 124 years. And what's more, while this book did make its way from Pennsylvania to Oregon, it most likely spent most of its time protected in people's homes, on a bookshelf, in a room, with glass windows keeping out the elements. And yet it's still starting to fall apart. You know, generally speaking, modern paper is better than the mediums that the ancient documents were written on in terms of cost and longevity, like, for example, papyrus. A pretty amazing in invention, papyrus, actually. Um, these e e Egyptians taking this plant, Cypyrus papyrus, also known as, interestingly, Nile grass, taking Nile grass and making something that you can write on to, to preserve our, our memories or our thoughts or our histories. And in a dry climate like Egypt, it, is, it can last a long time, and yet not forever. It's, it's really vulnerable to mold and becomes increasingly brittle over time with a tendency to crack along its natural grain. In fact, here's another example for you. A physical example, I, I actually have a papyrus scroll, which was also given as a gift. It is less than 10 years old, comes from Egypt where it was handmade uh, using the same time-honored tradition that they've been making, using to make papyrus for thousands of years, but still, after a mere 10 years, spending most of its time in its protective uh, tube, some of the pigment is starting to rub off, probably, or flake off, probably from being slid in and out of its protective tube. And when I unroll it, it's crackling a lot more than it did 10 years ago when I received this. This is after just 10 years. Uh, papyrus, by the way, is one of the mediums that was most used in the writing of Scripture. You know, the, the other common media for Scripture was parchment or vellum. It was made from animal skins, and it's a little tougher and more flexible than papyrus, also more expensive. But it also tends to fall apart over time. I mean, it has its own particular weaknesses. And the inks and the pigments that they used, regardless of what they were writing on, those also have a tendency to fade over time, because everything falls apart over time. I mean, it's exactly what Isaiah says. The grass withers and the flower fades. So how then can the word of our God stand forever, especially if it's written on, well, literally grass? Well, Psalm 119 reminds us that forever God's word is settled in heaven. But what about the word that's right here among us in our scriptures? You know, this is a problem that is often pointed out by the opponents of the Christian faith. You don't have the original Bible, they say. You don't have it. You just have copies of copies of copies. So how can you know it's reliable? Well, first of all, we need to know that every ancient, dobby, uh, ancient document is copy of a copy of a copy of a copy because things don't last. You know, Christians often respond with like an easy answer. Like, for example, our scripture from last week. All scripture is breathed out by God, we say. So therefore, it's reliable. We know it's reliable because it says in Scripture that it's reliable. Well, you know, this kind of scriptural circular reasoning might work well for those who already believe, for us talking within the faith. You know, but, but for those who are outside the faith, it's not so helpful. 
Or, for example, those who are actually in the faith, but their faith is under attack. Or their faith has already been shaken. You know, just telling people to have faith or to have more faith isn't actually all that helpful. I mean, we ask ourselves, can I even trust this book anymore? So while our faith is, for those of us who believe, a primary foundation for accepting the validity of the Bible, I mean, it is God's word, so of course God's going to take care of it, and he's going to take care of it through his people as they take care of it. But I, but I also actually want to give us some tangible physical evidence to help us gain some perspective on Scripture so we don't feel so beaten up by the world, to bolster or even to strengthen faith and confidence where it might be struggling or flagging behind, or even to, to create faith where there wasn't faith before. Uh, of course, in, in addition to the tangible evidence, I do also want to remind us up front that the very best evidence for the, the reliability of Scripture, the evidence that, that most shapes the lives of people, is that it is seen through the tangible, life-giving transformation that God's word has worked upon countless individual lives, including yours, through the power of his word, and the immense historic transformation that God's word and God's people rooted in that word have worked and continue to work upon society as they follow it faithfully. So the, the powerful truth of God's word is best seen as that word is made flesh in real lives, in God's Son primarily, in Jesus Christ, but also in the rest of God's children. So regardless of the data we look at, know that the living word is where the real power is at. So please keep in mind that as we're working through a lot of information, uh, we're going to be working through it at a very shallow level, and that for every single point that I'm looking at and, and some that I didn't even bring up, there are entire disciplines of study where you can get advanced degrees dedicated in these areas. Um, while I'm not an expert in any particular one of these areas, I do, do have some rudimentary knowledge that I'm so glad I get to use now and then, and I promise that I will always do my due diligence to get things right. I, I believe that Christians, more than any, we need to make sure we're getting things right so that we don't undermine the authority or the, the validity of God's word. So with that disclaimer out of the way, Let's take a brief look at the reliability of Scripture, starting with the textual evidence. So how do we even know that the Bible is true when all we have is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy? How do we know that it's historically valid? How do we know if, that it isn't just all made up? I, I mean, maybe you all remember several years ago the supposed conflict that was erupting around the, the Da Vinci Code, right, some years ago. For, for the record, I want to say that I believe a lot of that was manufactured conflict, meant to sell more copies uh, and to build careers. And, you know, it's dramatic, it's fictionalized claims uh, about, uh, you know, that, that much of what we believe about Jesus in Scripture was fabrication made up by this cabal, this this dark conspiracy of powerful people during the 4th and 5th centuries in their attempt to claim power over the culture. That was kind of the narrative. While the book or movie certainly wasn't unique in those claims, it's a clear example of the kinds of questions or accusations that are often raised around the subject of Scripture. But while dramatic, I, I want to say those claims could not be farther from the truth. And they just don't hold up to even the slightest historical examination, even secular historical examination. It's just plain fiction. So let's actually throw the New Testament into the pool with all of these other big historical documents and see how it does, shall we? We need to know that for any document in the world, again, what we have are copies of copies of copies because everything fades over time. There's no other option. And in fact, did you know that even your digital data fades over time and you have to keep backing things up again? You've got something really important. Make sure that you have more than one copy of it. Keep backing it up because that's the same issue we're dealing with when it comes to these documents. So uh, historians as, uh, or text critics, as they're looking at these ancient documents, there are a few questions that they use to examine them for reliability. First, how many copies exist? Second, how old are the manuscripts? And third, what is the exact nature of the differences or the variance between the copies? So we're going to come back to that third question in a minute, but first we're going to take the first two questions together. How many copies and how old? 
So do, do you think it's better to have more or less copies to work with when you're trying to examine an, an ancient text? Well, obviously more, right? More opportunities to compare them with each other, more data to pull from, so more is better. And do you want those copies to be closer to the source, the original writing and the events referred to, like older, or do you want them to be farther away? Well, obviously, again, you want them to be closer to the, to the original document. So when examining any ancient document, what we're looking for are more copies and older copies closer to the source. We're going to look at just a couple of historic documents that people generally just assume are history. There are no big questions, no conspiracy theories about these documents I'm going to list. They're just history. And people acknowledge that the, the writer might have a, an agenda, right? They might have an extra grind, but, but what they're talking about is still basically considered historical and valid without question. So as we go through these different uh, works, I'm gonna be using the words manuscript and copy probably interchangeably in a very general sense. So manuscript or copy could mean like the copy of the entire work, or it could mean a little tiny fragment of just a part of the work, or anything in between, any number of portions. It can be written on papyrus or parchment, or in some cases scratched onto pieces of pottery. And it can be written in any language, and they're all kind of lumped together. Uh, I'm going to be using, actually, uh, a sheet of paper uh, as a physical uh, example of each one of these documents of any kind. Okay, so let's start with Flavius Josephus first, since I, I already mentioned him. Again, uh, he was a first century Jewish historian, although uh, writing in Rome under the patronage of the Roman emperor. Uh, he wrote shortly after the time of, of Jesus. We have for Josephus 120 manuscripts. The oldest is from the 11th century, so about 1,000 years after it was written. A little far, but still considered history, and I'm going to place these behind me. This side means farther in history. That means earlier in history. So keeping on with uh, uh, there's Josephus, keeping on with the historians, we're going to look next at uh, the Greek historian Herodotus. He uh, wrote his histories, naturally histories of the Greeks, in the 5th century BC. And we have 106 various copies dating to around 600 years after he wrote, with one copy at 400 years, a little bit earlier. So fewer manuscripts, but closer to the source than Josephus. So I'm going to put them more in the middle here. The Roman historian Tacitus, he wrote his annals in the first century, and we have 36 various copies of Tacitus, um, uh, dating from 850 years to 1,050 years after he wrote, still considered history and fairly authoritative. I'm going to put him over here with Josephus. He's a little bit farther and earlier both. Uh, much better than Tacitus is an older Roman historian, Livy, whose history of Rome boasts a whopping... Ooh, Whopping 473 various manuscripts. I just rounded up to 500 so I didn't have to open this paper. Um, most dated to within 400 years of his writing. So that's pretty impressive. I'm going to put him a little over here on this side of Herodotus. Um, so impressive. Julius Caesar, emperor during the first century BC and also an author until Brutus and company put an end to both of his careers. Uh, apparently critics were just a little harsher back in the day. So he wrote an account of his conquest of Gaul called appropriately the Gallic Wars. We have 251 uh, of uh, copies of this, the oldest one dating from uh, the 9th century, so 900 years or so after, uh, though most of the number are actually somewhere around the 15th century, so that's another 600 years later, and yet still history. I mean, do we have any Caesar skeptics out there? Anyone doubt that Caesar existed? Anyone uh, have a, a, think there's a conspiracy theory about how Caesar actually conquered Gaul? Any questions? No, of course not. It's history. And just for fun, let's branch out from history into philosophy and, and story or, or kind of historical story. Plato, the, the great father of philosophy, wrote his tetralogy somewhere around the 5th century BC. This, this provided the grounding for some of the most influential ways of thinking in the Western world before Christ came along and still has massive influence today. In fact, many have said that all philosophy is just a footnote to Plato. Well, we have about 238 copies of Plato, most dated about 1,000 to 
1,200 years after they were written, except that there have been recent discoveries of two fragments dating back a mere 300 years after uh, they was writing. So that's pretty impressive. I'm going to try and get two out of here. Here we go. Oh, no. Two that come over here to 300 years. That's really impressive. Uh, the rest of it up here were around 1,000. And finally, what many scholars refer to as the most widely attested ancient document, it is the Iliad by Homer, the tale of the Trojan War. Not quite history, we don't think, yeah, but you all know it, right? The, the Trojan War, written in the 8th or 7th century BC. It's one of the older documents here. Um, but while really old, it's a good, good tale, and it has a lot of copies. It boasts a whopping 1,900 or more items. We're just going to round it up to an even 2,000. Oh, Homer's Iliad. Uh, except, uh, again, for a handful of fragments that are found that are within four or 500 years of the original. The rest, more around 1,200 years after the original. So way over here. Again, I'll put them on the end. Except, remember, there's two. I'm not going to break them open. Um, it's a clear winner, right? That's what the scholars say. That is until you consider the Bible. So we're just going to focus on the New Testament for now. Uh, each one of these packets contains 500 pages. But, you know, they don't come alone. They come in a big box. When it comes to the New Testament text, just in Greek manuscripts alone, we have more than 5,800 manuscripts, most of which are dated within three or 400 years of the originals. With at least one as early as 40 years of the originals. In fact, that's called P52. It's the Ryland manuscript which contains a fragment of John, the gospel, within 40 years of it being written, which puts to rest the argument that used to be thrown at Christians that John was made up much later. It clearly wasn't. The, the, the textual evidence says it wasn't. The Bodmer papyrus was less than 100 years after the originals. It contains both uh, most of the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Luke, the epistles of Jude and 2 Peter. The Diatessaron contains all of the Gospels within 100 years. The Chester Beatty papyrus contains most of the New Testament around 100 years after the New Testament was written. Codex Sinaiticus contains most of the Bible within 250 to 300 years. Vaticanus contains the whole Bible around the same time frame. Alexandrinus, the, the whole Bible only 50 years after that. Ephreme, the entire Bible only missing 2 Thessalonians and 2 John around the same time. And the list goes on and on. And then within that same period of time of a few hundred years, while the church continues to be marginalized and persecuted, the Bible is being translated into Latin, Coptic, Gothic, Syriac, Georgian, and then later Ethiopian, Armenian, and Slavic, and a host of other languages eventually. But just adding those that I already listed, we add nearly 20,000 more manuscripts all within a few hundred years, all, almost all before any of these other ancient manuscripts. Simply put, there is no other ancient document that comes anywhere close to the reliability of the New Testament. Remember the, the first two historical questions, how many and how old, how close to the source. Add together all of these other ancient heavy hitters, or these other ancient heavy hitters, and what you find is that they can't even altogether equal the same number of Greek manuscripts alone in either number or age, let alone the other translations. And I'm not even going to go into the Old Testament, the 42,000 or so Old Testament manuscripts, just because that doesn't seem fair. I'm also not going to mention the 36,000 or more quotations of the New Testament by the early church writers within the first few hundred years, so much so that you can recreate the New Testament from just the quotations. And of course, that gives you more sources to compare against all of these other documents. You know, as one scholar in this area of, of uh, expertise puts it, to be skeptical of the New Testament books is to allow all of classical antiquity to slip into obscurity, for no documents of the ancient period are as well attested as the New Testament. So before I move on to the content itself, I just want to ask one thing. 
with all of the stunning preponderance of textual evidence for the New Testament, why is it that only one of all of these ancient manuscripts is put so much under the microscope and is the focus of rabid skepticism and conspiracy theories and objections? And think carefully about this. You know, what do the rest of these ancient histories expect from you? What does Plato's philosophy expect from you? What does the story of the Trojan War expect from you? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But Scripture speaks of a living God who wants a relationship with you. All of this textual evidence speaks of a living God who wants a relationship you, with you, who wants intimacy with you, who expects also a certain kind of character to flow from the lives of those who follow. It costs nothing at all to take the rest of these ancient documents at face value. It costs everything to actually hear the voice of God speaking to you, inviting you into a new way of life. Okay, so I know I'm already really short on time, but let's just ask some of the other reliability questions that people bring up. Is it true? Is it accurate? Is it consistent? Aren't there lots and lots of mistakes or contradictions? Is it really infallible? I mean, how can we claim that the Bible is infallible if there are lots and lots of mistakes? So let's actually start with the mistakes and errors claim, since it closely relates to actually what we just saw in the text. Are there lots of mistakes and variations in the ancient biblical documents? Let me just be honest with you. Yes, yes, there are. There are lots of them. Now, don't freak out. Let me explain. So... Some scholarly opponents like to throw this one out on a regular basis, undermining your, test, uh, your trust in the text that you read. But, uh, but I, I would actually say that I believe these scholars are either being disingenuous or at least overly dramatic. Perhaps they're just trying to build their career. I don't know. One of these scholars, for example, Dr. Bart Ehrman, author of Misquoting Jesus, has often thrown around this line that he says, there are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. That sounds really dramatic, doesn't it? Because right? there are 140,000 or so words in the New Testament, and there are 400,000 textual variants, or as some people like to claim, 400,000 errors. Now, that's, uh, that sounds pretty, pretty bad, right? Is that pretty troubling to you? You know something? According to the experts, he's right. Is that troubling to you? I, I mean, I'll confess, I think he's right. But remember this. There are almost 6,000 different Greek manuscripts. That's what we're really talking about. Whenever you put two manuscripts next to each other and they aren't exactly the same, that counts as a variant. So here's an example. I remember those three questions from earlier. Let me put two versions of the same three questions up on the screen in front of you. Remember the questions. First, how many copies exist? Second, how old are the manuscripts? Third, what's the exact nature of the differences, the variance? So that's the first set of questions. Let me say it again. First, how many copies exist? Second, how old are the manuscripts? Third, what are the exact nature of the variance, the, or the differences, the variance? So, so what, what do you see right there, those two lines next to each other? It's exactly the same, right? Well, no, it's not. It's not the same, is it? All I did was use the numerical contractions for first, second, and third. But if we were comparing ancient manuscripts, that would count not as one variant because they're two, you know, the, the single, the manuscripts themselves don't count as the variant. It's the number of variants within the manuscripts. So that counts as three variants or as those people would say, three errors. Is there any error there? No, it's, it's, it's not an error, it's an alternate spelling. So add to that any actual misspellings or alternate spellings, like think British English versus American English. How does a British or Canadian person spell color? Well, different than the way we do, and that goes with a lot of different words. Gray or is it gray? I mean, there's so many different ways that you can look at those alternate things. They're not wrong, they're just different. And of course, you add to that the things that actually are errors, they were, you know, remember that scribes were hand copying all of these things. There were no Xerox machines. There were no scanners. They were hand copying everything with quills by like candlelight. And sometimes they would drop a letter or add a letter. Sometimes they'd write a word twice or skip a line or write the line twice, right? They're, they're writing, the Lord said to the man at the, and somebody says, hey, Bob, you coming to dinner? They look up and they're like, oh yeah, I'll be there in a second. Where was I? The, 
the Lord said. And they write it again. It's called dittography. It happened all the time. Not all the time, all the time, but it happened because they're writing little letters by hand. Oh, and by the way, there's no spell check. You know, if there was spell check, I would guess that about 80% of all the supposed errors that these people are pointing out would have disappeared. Just spelling, little errors, little drops, little ads that don't actually make a difference at all in the text. So it's disingenuous when you start to say there are hundreds of thousands of mistakes. There aren't. There are little scribal things, ma vast majority of the time. So is the Bible accurate? Well, let me put it this way. When the Bible's intention is to be accurate about facts, it's absolutely accurate about facts. When we supposedly find inaccuracies or inconsistencies in texts, it's almost always the case that people are trying to interpret something in a way that it wasn't meant to be read or placing their own assumptions on the text I, you know, I mentioned last week that not all scripture is written in the same style. It's not all meant to be read in the same way. When we try to make a parable literal or take a prophecy as history, well, you know, you get the picture. Anytime the Bible's historicity has truly been challenged, it has been put to rest, either and, and in a good way, right? Either through its own internal makeup or because archaeology has come out and around and said, actually, that is true. And for a long time, scholars were saying, that whole thing about Jesus being born during the time of Quirinius and the census, that's all wrong. It, that's not how history was. We don't have that in history. That's, and then suddenly archaeology came along and said, oh, guess what? Here it is, Quirinius, governor. And um, when, when you know, people said Jesus could not have been crucified under Pontius Pilate because Pilate wasn't governor. Well, actually, then they found this Roman inscription that celebrates Pilate as, gro as governor of Rome during that time. It is happened, or proconsul rather. It happened all of the time, and and yet, the Bible has never been disproven by archaeology, by history, by any other histories around it. It's never been challenged in a meaningful way. And by the way, when you do find inconsistencies in, in the text, it never changes the meaning of a story or the or the text. It never changes our basic understandings of what we believe. Not a single one of our of our doctrines has ever been. Uh, has ever been upset in any way by these supposed errors, never conflicting. There are, uh, that said, there are variations that are like real variations. For example, you can find in your footnotes, if you have a decent Bible, you go to 1 Samuel and look at the story of David and Goliath. And it, it, you'll see a little footnote when it says how tall Goliath is. The, the majority texts say that he was six cubits and a span. That's nine and a half feet. That's like the traditional understanding. He was a giant. But there are other texts that say he was four cubits in a span. That's six and a half feet. Well, nine and a half feet or six and a half feet, does that actually change the meaning of the story? For, for David, who, you know, the average Hebrew male was about five feet, and David was a kid, so he's going to be like four feet. Does it matter if Goliath is six and a half feet or nine and a half feet? No, it doesn't matter. It, do we throw the whole story out because we're not exactly sure what the, what the height of Goliath is? Of course not. The story is still there. And by the way, none of these are hidden that you probably see footnotes all over the place in the Bible. We usually skip past them. There are two big ones that I do want to point out to you. One is Mark 16. It's the ending of Mark. You'll notice that, that there's a little, it's kind of bracketed off in most uh, translations, and it says the earliest manuscripts do not contain these passages. Now, if you look at those passages, they're fine passages. They're great passages, and they're completely consistent with everything else that we've seen in Scripture. But at the same time, losing those other passages, if you decide, well, I'm not so sure about this, so I'm going to bracket these out and set them to the side, doesn't change in any way our, our understanding of what Jesus told us to do or who we're meant to be. And so that's one of them. The second one is John 8. It's actually one of my favorites. The woman who's caught in adultery. Such a great story of grace. And yet you'll see, it. again, it's bracketed out saying some of the earliest manuscripts do not contain these passages. Well, let me ask you this. Is, is that story consistent with Jesus? If Jesus was to, to you know, be presented with a woman caught in adultery, does it look like that's how Jesus would respond? Of course it does. In fact, John actually says at the end of, of his letter in John chapter 20, there are so many other stories that we didn't even include. But these stories that you do have are meant to, to, so that you might have life. That you might know the God who loves you. See, are, are these true? We're, we're actually going to talk about whether or not these are true next week or, or how these things are true next week as we, as we get look, look more at the authority of Scripture. 
But I want you to hold on to this, that truly, when it really comes down to it, the, the biblical uh, narrative is incredibly honest. In fact, the writers themselves are incredibly honest. They show you their own fault. I mean, look at the gospel according to Mark, which, which we understand came through Mark from Peter himself. And then look at how Peter is treated in the gospel of Mark. He did not try to hide anything. He's not trying to snow people to say, I'm a better guy than I really am. His warts are on display for everyone. It's one of the reasons that, that historians say this is this gospel thing, it's true. They didn't try to hide anything. They didn't try to hide our embarrassments. We didn't try to, to sugarcoat our heroes. We didn't try, like a lot of the other ancient documents, we didn't try to make people look better than they were. We include everything, including the shame. Because ultimately this story, like the passage of Isaiah we just read, what's it about? Yes, it's about the word of the Lord standing forever. But why does that matter? Put it in context of what we just read. Messianic promise. God himself is coming. He's going to straighten out his broken. Messianic promise. God himself is coming. He will lift you up even though you yourself are destined to fade. He will lift you up. And in the midst of that, this little passage, grass may wither, flowers may fade, the word of our Lord stands forever. And the word of our Lord is a word of redemption. It's a word of redemption. God is doing something in us and in our world. And that's good news. And we're going to talk more about this next week. But actually, I want to close with really quick advice when it comes to debating about the literal truth stories of the Bible. Do we need to debate people on, oh, this is true, you must believe. Uh, for example, the literal flood story. Do we need a literal flood story? Do we have to debate that with other people? You know, uh, rather than debate people when they say, oh, the flood story is so ridiculous. Instead of saying that, instead of saying, well, let me prove it to you. Let's go look at the, the strata and see there was a flood once. And I, I mean, rather than any of that, you know what I like to do? I like to ask them a question or a couple of questions, actually. You know what? That is a good, that's a kind of a weird story, isn't it? Why do you think that there are so many civilizations around the world that have a narrative of a great flood that covers the whole world? Like there's 150 different civilizations around the planet who all have very similar stories about everything getting flooded. And why do so many of these same stories, even though they're separated by so many miles, why do they all talk about the same themes in the story? Like, same kinds of things, like people being the problem of, of, that causes the flood, or, or a favored family being chosen out from all the people to be saved and, and to restore humanity, or, or having to rescue animals. Or how can they be so spread so far apart, and yet they still share this story? I mean, from the Near East, you know, Israel and the surrounding nations, and Egypt, and Russia, and China, and India, and Africa, and South American Native peoples, and North American Native peoples, and Fiji, and Hawaii, and the list goes on and on. What do you think that's about? Why do you think that's there? Why do you think that all these people learn from that story? And what is it that this story being in the Bible tells us? What's really important? What, what do you think is the, the relationship between judgment and wrath? Be between forgiveness and grace? Do you, do you ever wish that you could wash the earth clean? Do we ever need a rescue? You know, rather than having to debate the literalness of that story. Instead, we can get to what it's actually trying to say. You know, the word of our God remains forever. And he's telling us something really important about what it means to be his. We'll talk more about that next week. But I, I just pray that you can know that overwhelmingly, the evidence points to the scriptures, our scriptures as being incredibly reliable. And the most Clearly you see that is as you see the way it's changed the lives of people. And you know, it's, it, when, when Jesus is, uh, is in, early in his ministry and John has been arrested, John the baptizer has been arrested and John is in despair and he sends his disciples to say, is, is Jesus really the one? And Jesus sends them back this answer. You know, the, the blind they see, the, the, the lost are found, the lame walk. I mean, it's coming true. That's how we really know the reliability of Scripture. When you live by the words in this book, when you live by the story of a God who loves us this much, when you look at the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, it changes things. May it change things for you as well.
Let's pray. Lord, speak your word into our lives. Uh, give it reliability, not just because the science shows it or you know, the overwhelming evidence, but because we can hear your voice speaking to us. Hear your spirit bringing these words to life in our own lives. And Lord, through us into the lives of others. This is what we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Get shy on me and lift up your song Cause you've got a lot
know, I am so thankful that we have a God who speaks to us. And uh, not just in an ancient way, but he speaks to us still, and he's speaking to you. And I just pray that you are hearing his voice as he's calling you deeper into a sense of character in which you reflect the living word of God, a God who will never let you fade, and therefore uh, you will never let the people around you disappear either. Uh, so may God bless you this week as you would in uh,